Okay, well, let's, um, let's get started. So I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us for tonight's Lime Forest Block Conservation Project webinar. Um, as you know, my name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe, and I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. And uh, tonight's presentation is part of the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project, which uh, is a project that takes place in the Lime Forest Block Important Bird Area, which includes the towns of Colchester, East Haddam, Lime, Old Lime, East Lime, and Salem. And uh, this particular important bird area is important to wood thrush and cerulean warbler and a variety of other woodland nesting birds. Now, um, actually, let me just get my, my PowerPoint up and running here. Actually, share my screen. Okay. Um, so as you guys know, the Lime Forest Block um, uh, Conservation Project, um, during the first phase, we offered a lot of presentations, bird walks, workshops, and demonstrations um, to people who live um, and visit the Lime Forest Block, and that was done uh, with the help of a lot of partners. Um, and during the second phase of the project, we're offering habitat assessments to private landowners, and that those habitat assessments will be conducted by trained volunteers, uh, you guys, and this is the, the third webinar in our, our four-part webinar series. So this evening, uh, Kelly Morgan, uh, one of our Lime Forest Block assistants, will be giving an update on our homework assignment from last time. Then Hugh Odelig will be going over the habitats of our birders dozen species. After that, I'll cover the principles of managing woodlands with birds in mind, uh, or in other words, what should you guys be looking for when you are doing a habitat assessment? Then we will take a brief pause to go over the next homework assignment, and then I'll finish this up with a segment on landscape context. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Uh, as you guys know, if you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and write it in the chat box, um, and we will uh, try to be answering them as we go, or, or during you know, the end of one presentation, we'll stop and take a few questions before we move on to the next presentation. Uh, we want to make sure that you all have a good view for tonight's presentation. Um, oops, excuse me. So uh, if you uh, look at the, the top right hand corner of your screen, uh, you'll sort of see this, this button here. If you want to uh, show a grid view of participants, you can click that. If you'd rather just see the speaker, um, you can sort of click this button. Um, and if you want to exit full screen mode uh, or enter full screen mode, you can click either of these buttons. And then also um, in the middle of the screen, there's a spot that says uh, view options. And if you don't want to see anybody, you just want to see the presentation, you can the hide the video panel um, or you can choose side by side mode, which is where the presentation is on one side and any uh, people's videos are on the other side. So it doesn't block anybody's view. Um, okay. Uh, so I think uh, last thing, as you guys know, um, the webinar is being recorded. So if you have to step out for a few minutes, no worries. Um, you'll have the opportunity to go back and see what you missed. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Kelly. OK, so the assignment for you guys this past two weeks was to identify and take pictures of two trees, two shrubs, and two invasives. And there was a bonus of taking a picture of yourself removing invasives. And the goal was to use what you learned during the last webinar to identify natives and invasives. And you guys uh, outdid yourselves. It was fantastic to see all the work that you all did um, in what you learned with the last webinar and, and what you were able to take pictures of, identify, and many of you were pulling also. So next slide. Here's um, just some of the invasives that, that you guys all found. Um, and some of them weren't even on uh, the webinar, but they are invasives definitely. If we went up and made up a list of all the invasives in Connecticut, we would all be overwhelmed and probably depressed and no one would want to learn all of them. But um, you guys did a great job. Here's a couple pictures of the Winged Euonymus, next picture, next slide. And here's some great ones. We've got Japanese barberry and multifloral in here. And um, 
So what is a great lower left picture of why it's called winged euonymus. You can, you can see the wings right there and someone pulling. Great job. Next slide. More Japanese knotweed. Um, got some multifloral and autumn olive. Great pictures. Next one. And this was a list of just some of of the plant species that you guys have been able to identify. There's some great ones in here, including, you know, um, some of them are ones that we had on our webinar. Other ones um, are ones that you're just learning to identify. So great job on that. Next slide. And here's even some more. Great, great job. Um, I think, you know, it's great. People are learning all the different types of birches which if you find a birch tree and you look up the leaf and using between what Eric had given you and you know a, a lot of us use uh, iNaturalist, um, you can really tell the difference. So again, great job, you guys. Next slide. Yep, here's some Eastern white pine and uh, here's somebody that had, had Eric's photo. They printed it out and they put up a leaf that they found and they were able to identify it as white oak. So <clears throat> that's fantastic. And um, yeah, great job. Next photo. Someone was able to, to label these here, high bush blueberry, mountain laurel, and an invasive Japanese barberry. This here, <clears throat> was really great. Um, I'm, I'm going to read you what the volunteer wrote when I got sent this, this, um, this list of birds. I recently went hiking and found the plants listed. I tried my best to identify them correctly, and I think I got most of them right. For the trees, I was able to find a white oak and sugar maple and confirmed it by looking at their leaves and bark. The invasives were much harder to identify in my opinion, but I managed to find what looks like multiflora rose and a burning bush. As for the shrubs, my neighbor has blueberry bushes that were very easy to find. And I think I also found a mountain laurel while hiking near Harris Brook in Salem. And there's that beautiful mountain laurel. Also while hiking, I heard a bunch of birders dozen calls and was excited when I could tell them apart from each other. This is the list that the volunteer was able to identify by ear and how exciting it is that they were able to learn that through these webinars and go out to the woods and for the first time be able to identify them. So great job, great job, you guys. Next slide. <clears throat> so one of you went to a area that had three wooded streams leading to a large pond with two open cut fields between two of the streams. And this is their list of birds. That's a great list of birds and it's a great habitat. Um, tonight, Hugh is gonna be talking about how the birds associate with certain habitats. So these are birds that definitely belong in the areas that we just, we just read about here. Next slide. This is another outstanding list that someone was able to see. Um, and, you know, Corey's going to tell us a lot tonight about habitats and, and the structure and different diversities, uh, landscape context. So I'm going to share with you what the volunteer said about the area that they were hiking in. Mostly deciduous forest with edges abutting salt marsh and also abutting shrubby bushy thicket fields next to an open lawn. Large areas of moist forest soils with brook and abundant understory and saplings. Also an upland area with sections of oak and hickory forest and an old conifer stand. Noted also within the woodlands, there was an open canopy cut. So there was so many different habitats that was on the walk, on the hike that, that this volunteer took. That's why they were able to see so many different types of birds. And I, I think it's fantastic that you guys are, are still handing in the bird stuff, you know, let us know what you're finding for birds. Keep working on birding by ear. Next slide. 
and here's a beautiful warm eating warbler that that one of the volunteers set in sent in that's a a great photo um keep up the great work you guys are really putting in a lot of effort and we appreciate it and we commend you for it so thank you so much okay here's our first poll you guys describe the understory in this picture so the poll is going to come up as is it open do you think it's moderately dense or do you think it's very dense so describe the understory we'll give just a just a few minutes here. Okay, I think we got okay. mostly everybody. Okay. There's our results so far. Okay. All right, we'll probably do this poll later on and See if you still have the same answer. That's 69% at moderate, so we'll see. Okay. And uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to Hugh to talk to us about the uh, habitats of our birders dozen species. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so Hugh can go ahead and share his. Okay, so I'm um, going to be going over the birders dozen again now, um, this time primarily focusing on the habitats that they associate with, but um, we'll do a little bit of, re re of review on identification. Um, so this is the American woodcock again. Now just to review, they're a small stocky bird found primarily in the eastern United States. Um, short legs, short neck, and a long straight bill. Uh, we went over the identification last week, so I'm just going to move on to habitat. Um, the American woodcocks spend most of their time hidden in fields or on the forest floor probing for earthworms. Um, they prefer forests, forest edges, um, old fields and wet meadows of eastern North America. Um, they nest in the woods but use open meadows for their courtship display where they launch themselves in the air. Um, this erratic display includes a twittering sound as they fly and ends in a steep dive back to the ground. So typically they would be preferring deciduous forests with a dense understory. And that open habitat is, is pretty important. If they don't have an area to display um, near the, the sort of dense, the, woodland, the woodlands that they're, they're hanging out in, um, you know, it's not going to be good habitat. So this species kind of needs a sort of you know, two components. They need woodlands with dense understory and then they need that open area too. Um, so this is the uh, black-throated blue warbler, um, distinctive black and blue warbler. Um, and uh, let's see. So breeding range is located in the interior of deciduous and mixed coniferous forests in the eastern North America. Um, they're very sensitive to forest fragmentation and typically will these birds forage in the understory and lower canopy of forests where they pick insects from the underside of leaves. Um, the males sing to defend breeding territory and aggressively chase away rival males, uh, typically found in larger tracts of deciduous or mixed woodlands with a shrubby understory and often can be associated with striped maple or mountain laurel. So uh, this is the black-throated green warbler, um, another small songbird of the New World warblers um, with the olive green crown, 
um, yellow face and olive markings, olive green back with uh, white wing bars. Let's see. They are um, active and agile, primarily foraging for small insects in the leaves of uh, tall trees. Um, breeding males sing on exposed perches where their bright yellow head is very distinctive. Um, they typically will use coniferous and mixed forests in the north, deciduous forests in the south. Um, migrating birds typically will frequent any wooded, ha wooded habitat and even come down from the canopy to forage on uh, fruiting shrubs. They prefer forests dominated by hemlocks compared with white pines and prefer a closed canopy with even aged woodlands. Or uneven, sorry. Um, this is the uh, chestnut sided warbler, um, another New World warbler um, breed in eastern North America and southern Canada. Um, just as review, they're somewhat stocky and stout build for a warbler, have a yellow crown and a black mask, and often hold their tail cocked above their body line. Uh, they can be seen uh, hopping along small branches, inspecting the undersides of leaves, and are typically associated with saplings rather than mature trees. Um, they nest in young deciduous regrowth and other thickets where small trees and shrubs have been regenerating for a few years after a disturbance. And um, this is the eastern wood peewee, a medium-sized slender gray flycatcher with a peaked head and two wing bars. They're most common in deciduous forest woodland, but may be found in any forested habitat. Uh, even sometimes smaller woodlots for breeding. Um, Eastern wood peewees are sit and wait predators that sally out from arboreal perches after insects returning to the same perch or one nearby. Um, they favor the margins of clearings, such as uh, around meadows, roadsides, wetlands, or small openings, such as canopy gaps. Uh, and they also often associate with snags and sometimes uh, in the, the leafy mid-story. Um, this is the Louisiana water thrush, um, a thrush-like warbler that walks on the ground around the water's edge, preferring small, fast-flowing and rocky streams um, in hilly, deciduous forests. They typically stay on the ground, foraging for aquatic and terrestrial insects along the water's edge, turning over dead or wet leaves to find their prey, and also can be seen flying out over streams to catch flying insects. Uh, they typically will nest adjacent to stumps or other woody debris and typically prefer a nearly closed canopy. This is the pileated woodpecker. Um, again, just to review its appearance, they are a large black woodpecker with a somewhat striking red crest and a chisel-like beak. Um, they have broad wings with distinctive white patches when in flight. Um, and as for its habitat, this insectivorous bird is an inhabitant of deciduous forests in the Eastern US, the Great Lakes region, and boreal forests of Canada, and can be found also in parts of the Pacific West Coast. Um, they can nest in large dead trees called snags, or they can even be even in large live trees as well. <laughs> Uh, they excavate deep into rotten wood to find the uh, nests of carpenter ants and leave distinctive rectangular holes. Um, they prefer matured deciduous or mixed deciduous coniferous forests and um, require large trees for nesting and roosting cavities and also require large forest blocks with plenty of snags and downed logs.
Uh, this is the Scarlet Tanager, a medium-sized American songbird. They have a thick, blunt-tipped bill. And uh, just as a review, the breeding males have the bright red bodies with black wings and tails. And while females and immature males are olive yellow with darker olive wings and tails. Uh, scarlet tanagers are found in the eastern United States and are fairly common in deciduous forests. They prefer a mostly closed canopy and they often remain out of sight as they forage in the leafy upper branches but they can be easily identified by their distinctive call. Um, I was uh, on a walk this morning and I uh, heard one of these and uh, didn't see it way up in the canopy, but I could definitely hear it. And then I was walking back to my house. I ended up talking to one of my neighbors and I told him I saw a scarlet tanager or heard one. And he was like, what's that? And, and I showed yeah. him a picture and he's like, oh my God, I've never seen one of those. And then I played the song like the chick burr and he was like, Oh, wait a second, I've heard that. And, and now I, I hope that that has excited him to actually go try to keep, look, look for the Scarlet Tanager the next time he hears that song. Yeah, I've, I've been hearing them at my mom's house. Uh, definitely last weekend I was working in the garden. Um, they uh, breed mostly in deciduous forests where um, oaks are common, but will also use maple, beech, and other trees. Um, they're primarily insectivorous in the summer, but will also eat fruit during migration and on wintering grounds. Uh, this is red-eyed vireo. They have a stocky body with fairly short tail, um, olive green above and clean white below, have a gray crown and a white eyebrow stripe bordered by black. Um, they're actually one of the most numerous summer birds in the eastern forests, although not the most often seen because they tend to stay out of sight in the leafy treetops foraging for insects. However, its song can be heard all day long, even on hot summer afternoons when most birds have stopped singing. Um, Red-eyed vireos prefer woodland habitats and breed in deciduous and mixed forests, occasionally in conifers. They prefer open woods with undergrowth of saplings clearings or edges of burns. And uh, can be found along streams in solid forests or prairie groves. They move slowly and methodically scanning leaves for their preferred prey of caterpillars and um, are typically associated with large expanses of deciduous forest, particularly, particularly with trees with large leaves such as maple and uh, they require moderate understory and are often found near canopy gaps. This was the, the most uh, dominant bird I, I had on my, my walk through the woods this morning. Um, you know, the area I was walking had a really nicely developed midstory. And uh, since these guys are sort of foraging in the midstory, I'm gonna guess that that is why I had a lot of them. And one thing that uh, can make red ivory a little tricky to, to see is that uh, while some birds are sort of singing and moving around to, at the same time, red-eyed vireos will just sort of sit there on one branch and sing, and they won't really move around very much. So it makes them a lot harder to actually see because they're just sort of sitting and singing versus sort of moving around and singing at the same time. This is the viri. Um, a North American woodland thrush with a cinnamon brown back and a speckled breast. Uh, they're medium sized with a fairly plump body, round head, and uh, fairly long wings and legs. Um, they prefer wetter woodlands and uh, lowlanded wetland habitats. They forage on the ground and in logs for invertebrate prey, um, bounding across the forest floor with long springy hops or perching quietly in the undergrowth. Uh, they typically prefer damp deciduous woods with a moderately closed canopy and a dense understory and um, can often be found near leafy growth near water. Um, in mature forests, avoid areas with little understory concentrating along streams or other openings. They typically use woody debris for nest sites and shelter. Yeah, these I, I see near my mom's house all the time. So she has a couple of different streams running through her property. 
Cool. Uh, this is the worm eating warbler, um, small New World warbler that uh, breeds in the eastern United States. Um, they're a ground nesting bird and prefer hillsides and slopes. Um, they are typically found in the undergrowth of deciduous woods, um, less colorful than other warblers and also typically more sluggish. Uh, they forage in the woodland understory or on the ground, probing among dead leaves with its relatively long bill. Um, despite its name, it doesn't actually eat earthworms, but prefers caterpillars. Um, they prefer leafy wooded slope habitats with cool shaded banks, sheer gullies, and steep forested slopes. And uh, typically will be associated with medium-sized trees in a closed canopy with um, a dense undergrowth of saplings and shrubs. One neat thing about this bird is, um, you know, while they, they, during the nesting season, when they actually have a nest that's occupied, they are in the woods, you know, in the forest understory. But once their chicks fledge the nest, they will take um, advantage of canopy gaps or other openings in a forest like a power line corridor or a sort of shrubby meadow. Um, I run a bird banding station at the Bend of the River Audubon Center and every year towards the end of June we end up catching worm-eating warblers in the middle of these shrubby fields. So it's kind of they're sort of going into the field or into a canopy gap or some sort of opening to take advantage of the, the, the abundance of insects and fruit that can be found in those locations. So uh, this is the wood thrush. Actually, I heard a few of these this weekend. I was out fishing along the Quinnebog River. I didn't see them, but I, I heard a few calling. Um, they're North American pastoring bird, closely related to other thrushes and widely distributed across North America. Um, just as review, wood thrushes have a brown back and a heavily spotted white breast, um, a short tail and an upright posture, and are a little bit smaller than a robin in size comparison. Uh, they're fairly common in many eastern woodlands, and um, its flute-like song is beautiful and adds music to summer mornings. That's definitely what I had heard uh, this weekend out fishing. Uh, wood thrushes are ground foragers associated with leaf litter and typically feed on insects and earthworms. Um, found mainly in deciduous woods and breed in the understory in uh, areas with tall trees. They're um, more numerous in damp forests near streams than in dry woods, prefer a closed canopy in a moderate mid-story and shrub layer, and like a fairly open forest floor with damp soil. They're absolutely my most favorite sounding bird. And the same as you, Hugh, I was out near the water last week and I could hear several of them and their voice is so loud and it carried across the water. They're beautiful. Um, you guys see if you can see if you guys can hear one this week because they are just amazing. Yeah, they're they're definitely one of my favorites to to, to hear when I'm out. Okay, and um, this is the is this the homework assignment from last week? Maybe I didn't. It was yeah. That. So okay, so. Um, yeah, our new homework assignment, um, I think we have a slide about it later, but you guys will probably want to hear about it now. Um, Corey's going to talk to us about, um, about different um, features that are found uh, outside that, that the, um, you know, the birds will associate with. So we're going to have you guys go outside and find what features you have on your property and take a picture of it. Um, she'll tell you tonight what, what they are, what the things are to look for. So we want pictures of what's on your property. If, if you don't have anything on that, like that on your property, you can go for a, a walk and take pictures of it and send it in. Tell us about it. Okay. And uh, as Kelly said, we'll, we'll kind of go over that again later, but uh, it's a good incentive for sort of for paying attention to uh, what we're about to go over. And um, so what I want to cover over the next 25 minutes or so is the, the principles of managing woodlands for birds. Um, and another way of putting that is, uh, what is, what are the things that you need to be looking out for or um, sort of assessing 
when you are doing your habitat assessments for landowners. Um, and uh, one thing I just want to point out is that when you go to do your habitat assessment, you know, you will have the data sheet and, you know, everything that I'm going to cover, you know, all the different topics are on the data sheet. So that will help you remember um, which things to be looking out for and assessing and, and uh, taking into consideration. So, um, you know, I think we're going to kind of cover a lot in the next 25 minutes, but when you go do your habitat assessment, you will have this data sheet that will uh, you know, mention all of the different things I'm talking about. So that will help kind of trigger those things in your mind when you're, you're walking the property. Uh, so when we think about uh, assessing a property, uh, there's, it really can be divided up into two parts. Um, one is horizontal diversity, uh, which is the different types of habitats across an area or across a property. And one is vertical diversity, which um, is sort of the, the sort of vertical structure of a woodland area. Um, and that can include living components, such as the understory, the midstory, and the canopy. Um, and also it can include non-living components. So the leaf litter, fine and coarse woody material, uh, snags and cavities. Um, and uh, as we go through tonight's presentation, we'll be talking, we'll kind of be going in depth on these topics. And then um, also, you know, if you notice that there's you know, uh, not too much to the understory. What are the recommendations you might make to a landowner uh, so they can address that? If you notice that there's uh, not much fine or coarse woody material, what is the recommendation you might make to the landowner? Uh, so we're also gonna, I'm gonna include that in tonight's presentation as well. So as I mentioned, horizontal diversity is the arrangement of different habitat types across the landscape. Um, so when you are out doing your habitat assessment, you are going to have a map of the property um, that you can look at. And when you look at that map, and also when you're walking the property with the landowner, you want to be thinking about how many different habitat types do you see. Uh, this is a map of East Rock Park in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, this is, was made by the, the forester that we work with, Eric Hansen. And uh, you can see he sort of divided it up into sort of the different habitat types. So, uh, number one is hardwood forests, like in this picture here. Uh, number two is mixed wood forest. So um, actually just, you know, hardwood forest is deciduous forest. Uh, softwood forest is uh, coniferous forest. And then mixed wood is where you have both deciduous and coniferous forest. Um, and then the property also had riparian forests, uh, like the picture on the top right. And then it also had some open areas, picture on the bottom right. and uh, if a property has a bunch of different habitat types, it will have a bunch of different birds associated with it. Um, so the more habitat types you can find on a property, the more habitats um, that can support a larger diversity of birds. So um, deciduous forest or hardwood forest is where you're gonna find scarlet tanagers. You'll hear them going chick burr, chick burr up in the canopy. Uh, riparian areas, so areas along rivers or along streams or um, maybe adjacent to small ponds. Uh, not one of the forest uh, birders dozen, but warbling vireos are a bird that you can see near wet areas. They have a really cute call. Um, if you imagine warbling vireos eating caterpillars and saying, if I see you, I will squeeze you, I will squeeze you till you pop. And that's how you can remember a warbling vireo song. <laughs> that pop at the end is very distinctive. And then in open areas, you know, you might you know, find an eastern bluebird or tree swallows. Those are birds that associate with, uh, with open areas. Now, um, just to, to give you guys an example of, of how to do this, here's a property. I actually walked this property last week. And um, I want you to, to jot down in the chat, um, you know, some habitat types that you think you see when you're looking at this picture. And I'll have Kelly read off um, what people put into the chat. Somebody said they see a wooded area, mostly hardwood, coniferous, some soft, open areas, mixed forest, open areas, riparian forest, hardwood forest, open meadows. Excellent. Deciduous, no leaves. Deciduous, Coniferous mixed. 
Great job. Okay, I think you guys, you guys nailed this. So and buildings um, and buildings. Yep. So, uh, you know, if you look at this and this is, you, know, we, we are, you guys are going to get maps of the properties that you'll be assessing. And, um, you know, this is, we'll always kind of give you a, a photo uh, or an image that has the, you know, it with the, the property without the leaves on the trees, because you can sort of see into the woods a little bit better then. Um, but this property, it's got a developed area. You know, this is the area around the house, uh, which uh, if the landowner has planted a lot of native vegetation around the house, that can be a, a valuable spot for birds. Um, and when I actually walked this property, there was a lot of great birds that were showing up at the feeders uh, in the, the landowners um, that the landowner had out um, and were taking advantage of various plants that they had right around the house. Um, there's a meadow, which is this big open area here, which had a bluebird in it. Um, also some yellow threaded vireos, which like forest edges. Uh, there was the hardwood or just sort, of, sort of deciduous woodlands that made up, you know, the largest sort of area of the property. There was the softwood um, or evergreen component, uh, which was made up of a white pine grove. And then this section here was actually pretty interesting. This was a larch, which is a, a deciduous uh, tree, but it looks like an evergreen. So it does lose its needles in the wintertime. And then this area uh, here is a, a forested wetland. So, um, you know, you can sort of see there's a stream, but it really spreads out over the course of this property and they have this pretty wet area. Um, so a lot of, of diversity of habitats here, which you created to a lot of diversity of birds. Um, one other thing I want to mention, and I'll kind of go back to this picture for just a second, is, um, you know, one thing that we uh, often recommend to landowners if they have if they have a meadow or an open area uh, is to create a soft edge. Um, and this is if you look at this meadow here, um, that's actually a recommendation that I made to the landowner uh, because this was basically forest and then straight to a field. Um, you know, so very few sort of shrubs um, or, or sort of mid story or under story vegetation right along the edge. Um, so this is just another example of that. So here we have a pond. And you literally going right up to the pond, you have the forest and there, there's sort of no um, sort of gradient from the, the, the canopy uh, to the, the pond. It's just sort of straight down uh, versus uh, what we try to recommend uh, to landowners is that they create a soft edge um, where they have openings. And this is where this is the bent of the River Audubon Center in uh, Southbury, Connecticut. But I, I think this picture is a great example of a soft edge. Uh, but you can sort of see how it goes from uh, grass to perennials to small shrubs to taller shrubs and then to you know evergreens and uh, you'll see a big oak tree in the background so there's a real it's kind of a stadium effect um, and that's something we try to recommend uh, where you have a transition from uh, either deciduous or coniferous forest to uh, a field is to have this this soft edge Moving on to vertical diversity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, vertical diversity is the, the complexity of vegetation and other structures as they are vertically arranged in the forest. And um, for the purposes of, of habitat assessments, we define the understory as the basically from ground level to five feet above the ground, the midstory as six feet to 30 feet above the ground, the canopy as more than 30 feet, and those make up the living components uh, of vertical diversity. And then the sort of non-living components are the leaf litter, you know, which is right on the ground. Uh, woody material, uh, which is, you know, just a little bit above the ground. It's kind of like the, the understory or the midstory of the non-living material. And then um, cavities and snags, um, which are kind of the, the canopy of the non-living material. Uh, so those are these are kind of the six things that you want to be thinking about when you are, are walking the woodlands with landowners. And we're going to kind of go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. So the understory, as I mentioned, um, you know, is that area from uh, zero, you know, the ground level to about five feet up. And uh, the picture on the left is an example of, of a sparse understory. Uh, you can really see that there's very little vegetation uh, at ground level versus the picture on the right is, is a very dense understory. And one way to gauge this is, is by when you're walking through the woods with the landowner, how far can you see through the woods? You know, if you can see, you know, 50, 100 feet away from you, um, as you could in the picture on the left, you know you've got a pretty sparse understory. 
Um, but if you can only see about five to 10 feet away from you, you know, you've got a pretty dense understory. Um, you know, and if it's somewhere in the middle, you know, maybe it's a moderately dense understory. And uh, the whole property doesn't need to have a dense understory, but it's important that there are pockets of dense understory on a property. Uh, because where you have dense understory, you tend to have uh, a lot of birds. So uh, as Hugh mentioned, the black-throated blue warbler, which goes beer, 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 bee, uh, they are associated with dense understories of mountain laurel or striped maple in Northwest Connecticut. And the veery as well, um, which nests right on the ground, is associated with areas of dense understory. Um, the oven bird is another example of uh, birds that just uh, are in the understory, they're nesting in the understory, foraging the understory, and the, the more understory vegetation there is, the better habitat it's going to be for those species. Here are two pictures of the midstory, and uh, the one on the left is a, a fairly open midstory. Um, you know, again, you can sort of see, see through the forest fairly well, um, versus the picture on the right is a, a moderately dense midstory, so you can't see through it as well as, as you could in the first picture. And um, I don't have a, I'm, you're gonna, I have a picture later on of, a, of a, what I would consider a very dense midstory, but you typically only see a very dense midstory where you have regenerating forests. So um, if you had an area that was cut down um, maybe 10 to 15 years ago and it's been regenerating, uh, that's where you have a really, really dense midstory. Uh, so these are kind of open midstory, moderately dense midstory, and then we'll see a picture in a little bit of a, what I would consider a dense midstory. And uh, whether you have, if you have a property and there are some areas with open midstory, some areas with moderately dense midstory, that's actually good because in an open midstory is where you're going to find the eastern wood peewee. Uh, peewee, peewee, peewee. And uh, as Hugh mentioned, these guys like to have an open midstory because they like to sally out from um, a perch to grab an insect and then they go back to where they were sitting. Um, so having that ability to sort of fly around in the, in the midstory is, is a beneficial thing for eastern wood peewees. And then the wood thrush is a species that likes a moderately dense midstory. Um, this is a picture of a wood thrush that I took a few years ago. And, uh, I was walking a property with a landowner and I was talking about the value of a dense understory, a dense midstory. And I said, this looks like great wood thrush habitat. And they said, oh, look, there's a wood thrush nest. It was magic. <laughs> um, but uh, this wood thrush nest was like six feet above the ground and, um, you know, just sort of nestled in a, in a bunch of um, beech saplings. So uh, it was just an example of, uh, you know, the type of hab, you know, having a sort of a, a group, a, stand, a small area of of regenerating saplings can provide valuable habitat for wood thrush and other uh, mid-story associated species like red-eyed vireo. Now, when it comes to the canopy, um, you can see a picture of an open canopy on the left. And this is uh, the sort of example I have of what a, it's also, it shows open canopy, but it also shows more of what a, a dense mid-story would look like. So uh, without a canopy um, sort of shading out the mid-story or the understory, is when you really see the, the densest um, mid-story um, areas. And then on the right, you can see a picture with a closed canopy. And uh, you know, again, both of these habitats have value. Um, you know, the chestnut cider warbler is very likely to be found in areas with, with an open canopy where you have a very uh, nicely regenerating uh, understory or mid-story with lots of sapling, tree saplings. Um, chestnut sided warbler goes, uh, please, please, please to meet ya. Uh, and you would definitely hear them in this picture here. Another species that not part of the bird is dozen, but similarly associates with, with regenerating forests with open canopies and lots of uh, vegetation in the midstory is the uh, rose breasted grosbeak. And there's, there's actually one of them that's been singing outside my window um, for the last week. And uh, I've got it, I'm going to have to go take a look and see if there's an area like this nearby that maybe that bird is associating with. Um, and then a lot of the forest birds uh, like a closed canopy. So uh, the scarlet tanager likes a uh, closed canopy hardwood forest, lots of oaks and hickories. Uh, and the black-throated green warbler likes closed canopy softwood forest with lots of hemlocks. Uh, the black-throated green warbler again is the one that goes, strangers in the night, or uh, trees, trees, murmuring trees, makes those two different songs. 
Uh, I also want to just reiterate the value of canopy gaps. Um, so, you know, scarlet tanager, uh, other birds, they definitely, some, they, they, you know, like having a closed canopy, but there is a lot of value to be had from canopy gaps, whether they are natural because uh, some trees maybe blew down in, in a, a, a storm or um, a bunch of branches fell down during an ice storm, um, or, um, we know that we lost some trees to emerald ash borer or uh, gypsy moths. That sort of natural canopy gap, uh, you're going to see a lot of sunlight getting through to the mid-story, to the forest floor, which will have a lot of insects associated with it, lots of berries. So you frequently will actually see scarlet tanagers near canopy gaps, red-eyed vireos, uh, eastern wood peewees. Um, and canopy gaps can also be man-made as well. Uh, you know, some, something we sometimes recommend to a landowner or a forester might recommend to a landowner um, is to sort of create a canopy gap. If there's a, you have a closed canopy throughout your property, um, creating a canopy gap will, will just sort of diversify the habitat a bit. Um, some other things to keep in mind when you're looking at the sort of living components of vertical diversity. So when you're looking at the understory, the midstory, and the canopy, you want to assess density, um, but you also want to look at uh, what are the species that are there? So are there hard masting species like oaks and hickories that produce nuts? Are there soft masting species um, that produce berries? Things like uh, black cherry, blueberry, huckleberry, viburnums, are those present? Uh, are there invasive plants? Uh, you don't see too many invasives in the canopy uh, or the midstory, but certainly you see invasive plants in the understory as Many of you did this, this last two weeks while you were out taking pictures. Um, so uh, what is the sort of density of invasive plant species? Are they uh, you know, really just found in one area on the property? Are they throughout the property? Are there a few different species, just one particular species that seems to be dominant? Those are questions to, things to think about when you're looking, you know, walking a property. Um, also, is there, is there a softwood component? Are there evergreens? Um, you know, the, you have a property that's just deciduous forest in the winter time there's not much cover for birds um, but if you have a property that has some evergreens um, in the winter time those evergreens are going to provide shelter and protection um, you know from from the elements as well as from predators so they do have a lot of value uh, and then also uh, are there host plants for caterpillars this is a slide that Eileen showed last time but it, it kind of talks about the the best caterpillar trees uh, that can be found in Northeast Woodlands. And uh, I did check, this is in uh, Bringing Nature Home, uh, the book by Douglas Talmy that was published in 2007. And uh, uh, oaks are sort of the, the winner there with 534 different caterpillar species associated with them. Uh, willows, which are, tend to be found more in um, sort of wetland areas, have 456 species. Cherry, um, 456 as well. Birch, 413. Crabapple, 311. Uh, blueberry, just think about that. This blueberry is this little shrub that you see in the woods, has 288 different types of caterpillars associated with it. Uh, that's kind of mind blowing to me. But um, when I was doing my master's degree research on um, the distribution and abundance of early successional species in power line corridors in eastern Connecticut, uh, a lot of the power line corridors were full of blueberry and huckleberry. And uh, I was studying prairie warbler and uh, um, field sparrow and a, and a few other sort of early successional nesting species and the, these birds would be in, foraging in the blueberries and the huckleberries and they would just pop up with caterpillars and fly them back to their nest and feed them to their young. So um, they were definitely finding lots of little green caterpillars amongst the blueberries. So totally believe that number. Uh, one other thing to take into consideration when you're sort of assessing the living components of vertical diversity is are the canopy trees regenerating? Um, so if you're looking up in the canopy or looking at the, the tree bark uh, to sort of determine what trees are, are in the canopy. Um, you also want to sort of look at when you're looking at the understory, um, note are those species regenerating? You know, if there are oaks in the canopy, are there oaks also regenerating in the understory and the midstory? Um, or is it mostly black birch that are regenerating? Uh, one of the, the challenges that our woods, our woods across Connecticut face is that uh, oak is a very dominant plant in the canopy, um, but uh, for two reasons, uh, deer browse, and then also the fact that oaks are not very shade tolerant, 
there is not many oak trees uh, regenerating or, or it's, it's sort of limited regeneration. So if you think about all the, uh, the caterpillars that are associated with oak trees and our, our current canopy, um, and then if you think about what's the next generation of our forest gonna look like, if there's less oaks, um, there's presumably gonna be less caterpillars for birds. So that, that is definitely something a lot of foresters are trying to encourage the regeneration of, of oak trees uh, because they are an important component of our forests. Another thing to look out for, and I think Eric mentioned this a little bit, is uh, any signs of invasive insects. So uh, if there are hemlock stands, you want to be looking for woolly adalgid or um, scales, uh, the woolly adalgid being these little white tufts that you can see on the hemlock. And the scales are pretty hard to see in the picture, but they are these little lines that are sort of uh, on, the, on the, uh, the needles themselves. Uh, emerald ash borer is another insect to be on the lookout for. And I'm pretty sure at this point, um, emerald ash borer has spread entirely across Connecticut. And uh, the uh, beetle itself makes these little half circle holes in the trees. But then when woodpeckers uh, try to eat the beetles, they end up ripping off a lot of the bark. Um, so you'll sort of see it looks like the bark's been sort of ripped off of the tree. That's a sign of emerald ash borer. Uh, another thing to keep an eye out for, especially in eastern Connecticut, is gypsy moths. So there's a gypsy moth caterpillar on the left there. And you can see uh, some gypsy moths laying eggs on the right. And uh, this is a picture looking um, across the Connecticut River. I believe this take picture was taken in Middletown, but you can sort of see all these trees on the other side. The, the river is sort of right in the middle here, but all these trees on the other side of the river uh, are trees that have died because of gypsy moth infestations um, over the last few years. So, um, you, know, you know, obviously we don't wanna lose trees to gypsy moths, but the other side of it is that probably does create some canopy gaps and will sort of help enhance the understory in those areas. So um, not a great thing, but there's a, there's a positive to it. Um, so when you guys are out doing a habitat assessment, uh, what I want to sort of do is your role is to increase the landowner's knowledge about what makes for good bird habitat and also point out things that they should be keeping an eye on. Um, you're going to be sort of assessing different components of both the horizontal and vertical diversity of a woodland. And you might notice things like, you know, there's a sparse understory. So what sort of recommendations should you make to the landowner? And uh, the data sheet that you guys are going to get is going to have a list of recommendations. So your job is to sort of check off the ones that you think are appropriate. So um, what might some of those be? So say you had a sparse understory, so not much vegetation in the understory. Well, there's a few things that a landowner might be able to do with that. First, they might call a service forester um, to arrange a visit, and uh, they could talk to their forest, the forester about ways that they might be able to uh, enhance vegetation in the understory. And the forester might recommend um, creating some canopy gaps uh, you know, by taking down a few trees. Uh, they might recommend something called crop tree release, which is where you maybe have one tree, like a really healthy oak, and you want to promote that oak. Um, so you take out some of the trees around it um, to allow one more light into the understory, which will stimulate growth in the understory. Uh, but then it also gives that oak tree space so that um, hopefully uh, acorns that fall to the ground under the oak tree are able to regenerate and take advantage of that. That's sort of additional sunlight that's available. Uh, uh, the landowner might also um, want to promote uh, a dense understory by actually just planting some trees. Um, or shrubs. So if uh, you're going to try to enhance, if the landowner is going to wants to enhance understory just by planting things, you know, they want to pick plants that do well in the shade. So uh, spice bush, uh, witch hazel, uh, blueberries, uh, viburnums, they can do, they can tolerate the shade. Um, they definitely do better in the sun, but you know, those are just some plants that, um, you know, they might be, they might be able to plant to sort of enhance the, the understory um, on their property. If uh, you notice that there were a lot of invasives in this understory, a uh, recommendation you would choose is uh, for the landowner to learn more about invasive plants and develop a plan for monitoring and control. And I'm gonna go over that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, another one, if you notice a lack of horizontal diversity, uh, say you have a, you're assessing a property that is you know, just hardwood forest, just deciduous trees, um, you know, get recommendation would be you know, for them to call a service forester to arrange a visit 
and talk about uh, how, you know, with the forester about how they might provoke, pr promote a diversity of forest age classes. Um, maybe they would do a, a cut across an, an acre of forest and that would hopefully, uh, you know, allow for some, some young forest to grow there. And then instead of having just one habitat type, you know, um, an older forest, they would have two habitat types. They would have young forests and they would have old forests. I did want to just quickly mention uh, uh, Audubon has a Plants for Birds website, uh, which is if you just Google Plants for Birds, it will come right up at audubon.org slash plants for birds. And uh, this is a website that a landowner could go to and we can make sure that this is included in the recommendation uh, to learn about different plant species that are native that they could, they could plant um, on their property if they weren't looking to enhance the understory or maybe um, enhance the amount of native plants that are sort of directly around their house as well. Corey, this is on our Lime Forest Block Conservation website also. So any of you volunteers, I recommend go on there and click on this link. And if you want to plant any plants this spring and summer, whether you have a little patio and you want to put something in pots or you have an area that, that you want to do a ground cover with or you want trees or you want specific birds, um, you can go to that site and put in your location and what you want to do, whether you want to put in a, a tree or a shrub or perennial flowers or annuals, and it will give great recommendations. So go ahead there and check it out. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, I did mention uh, on the, at the end of our last call, we ended up having quite a discussion about sort of strategies for managing invasive plants. Because you might be walking a property with a landowner and you notice some barberry or some bittersweet and you point it out to the landowner and they say, well, what do I do about that? Um, so this is kind of just a quick list of things you could, you could sort of say to the landowner and, and things that, um, you know, based on what you put in the data sheet, we might be able to provide in the reports as well. But, um, you know, the first thing a landowner want to do is sort of just definitely assess what invasive plant species are there and uh, where is the infestation the densest. Um, so there might be just a handful of invasive species. Maybe there's one that's particularly dominant. Um, maybe there's a certain area where the invasives really are sort of out of control. Um, so, you know, and a sort of an assessment of invasive across the property is sort of the first step. Um, and then uh, when I talk to my landowners about man the land managers that Audubon Connecticut has at our various sanctuaries, one thing they always tell me is do not let new invasives get established. So, um, you, know, a, you know, landowner, you want to kind of maybe ask one of the recommendations might be learn your invasive plant species so that you can recognize if a new invasive plant is, 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 is showing up on your property. Um, when a new invasive plant shows up, you want to get rid of it ASAP so it does not get established. Another recommendation is that, you know, say invasives are just in one particular area and the rest of the property is free of invasives or nearly so, well, you want to keep that area free of invasives. So if there are a few there, tackle those, pull them out, cut them, um, use, you know, chemicals if needed, but, you know, deal with those invasives in that area where that's mostly free of invasives and keep it that way. And also sort of at the same time, prevent the spreading of invasives from those areas with the highest densities uh, into other areas. So you want to kind of have your, your fighting line and uh, kind of hold the invasives at bay. Something that was mentioned in our first webinar was the, the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group, SIPWIC, and I provided their website there. And one thing that they have on their website, which I actually find really helpful, is, um, let me see if I can pull that up really quick, because uh, I know I have it on my open up here. So this is SIPWIC's website, and if you go to uh, Get Involved, uh, and look into their symposium from 2018. One thing they developed was what's called the invasive plant management calendar. And it goes through the top 10 invasive plant species. And it talks about different management strategies, both mechanical, um, chemical, how to dispose of those invasives. And it literally goes through each species and kind of gives you the best techniques for, for managing that species. So that's a great website, a uh, great resource for, for landowners. And then, um, you know, also talk to them about what method of management they would be interested in. Uh, some people are, are dead set against using kind of chemicals. Some people are, are, have been battling invasives for a while and they're like, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, but that's something to discuss with them. 
Um, and then always remember to replace, nat replace invasives with native plants when possible. Um, you know, buying native plants you know, does have a cost associated with it, but if you're gonna be removing invasives in an area, you do wanna make sure that they're, you are sort of replacing the structure that the invasive plates, plants do provide. Okay, um, so moving on to the non-living components of vertical diversity. And I've just got a, a, a few slides here, and then um, I think we're, we're sort of ready to take a little bit of a break. Uh, but uh, one of the non-living components of vertical diversity is leaf litter. And uh, I've got a, a picture of a, a bird nest here, and this is an oven bird nest. And this is the species that is certainly the, the most tied um, to leaf litter. Now these guys, I, they're not, I don't believe they're a, forest, a forester's, uh, a bird's dozen species, but they are very common in, in our woodlands and they sound like teacher, 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 teacher. And uh, when you're walking through the woods with a landowner, you probably will hear them. And uh, so it's good to, to know that one too. And uh, the one thing about them is I almost feel like they're ventriloquists. The sound is coming from one direction and you look over there and you're like, I don't see the bird. Where's the bird? Um, they are, they are, seem to be good at sort of throwing their voices. So you, they never quite seem to be where you, you think they are. Um, I, when I was preparing this slide and this presentation, I kind of went back. Uh, Audubon did some, some bird studies in uh, 2011, 2012, and then again from 2014 to 2016 to look at relationships between woodland nesting birds and various uh, for char forest characteristics. And uh, one thing I realized was that the you know, oven bird got a lot of leaf litter, we get a lot of oven birds. But uh, some of the other species that we typically sort of think of as being associated with leaf litter, like wood thrush, deery, um, eastern towhee, uh, they want some leaf litter, but they don't want huge, huge quantities of leaf litter. The studies we did actually showed that the, if the sites that had the most leaf litter, uh, really oven bird was the only species that would associate with those sites. Um, but all these other birds, they do want some leaf litter. So if you have an area that has no leaf litter, um, that's certainly um, not going to be attractive to a variety of birds. Another non-living component of vertical diversity is fine and coarse woody material. Um, so fine woody material is four inches or less in diameter, and coarse woody material is four inches or more in diameter. And um, Fine and coarse woody material is valuable because uh, where you've got uh, you know, lots of sort of, um, sort of timber on the forest floor, as that timber is sort of biodegrading, uh, there's a lot of insects associated with it. It also can provide you know, sort of protective areas for birds to hang out. They can find safety from predators um, or the elements underneath some of this um, fine and coarse woody material. And another important uh, thing that course for about fine and coarse woody material, especially um, you know, if you have a lot of it in a, in a big pile, is that it provides an opportunity for uh, trees to regenerate where they aren't going to get browsed by deer. Um, so that, that is actually a, a kind of an important thing to know. You've got a lot of uh, fine and coarse woody material in the understory, then um, oak, you know, acorns or other um, sort of seeds have an opportunity to, to regenerate and start growing. Uh, and be able to avoid deer browse for those first few years. So that's another sort of important um, thing, value, you know, value that coarse and, and fine woody material has. Um, and then the last uh, non-living component is snags and cavities. So snags are, are basically dead trees that are still standing. You know, cavities are, are holes in, in either dead or living trees. And uh, it's pretty surprising the number of birds that are associated with cavities. So these are our excavators, the woodpeckers. So northern flicker, pileated woodpecker, red-bellied, yellow-bellied sapsucker, hairy woodpecker, downy woodpecker. These are all species that excavate cavities. Um, there's one additional bird. Uh, Black-capped chickadees will also make their own cavities. But then these are all the species that will take advantage of those cavities. Um, so, uh, as you can imagine, uh, cavities are really valuable, um, you know, so if you have a forest that doesn't have many cavities in it, um, you know, it's not going to provide as many sort of uh, nesting sites or roosting sites as a forest that has more cavities associated with it. And uh, one way to increase cavities is to in increase the number of snags or sort of allow 
snags to continue to stand um, in the woods in areas that maybe aren't heavily tra trafficked by people because um, those are the, the woodpeckers will take advantage of the snags to sort of create excavations. Uh, so again, if, if you're walk, talking to a landowner and you're sort of making and assessing their, their woodlands, um, if you notice uh, maybe there's a limited fine or coarse woody material, you know, what recommendation might you make to the landowner? So uh, retained down deadwood. There are a surprising number of people out there that, that feel like they have to clean up their woods and will sort of drag branches out of the woods and dispose of them or burn them. Uh, you know, we want them to understand that, you know, down deadwood, so fine and coarse woody material really does have value um, and that it'd be good to sort of leave that. Um, another recommendation you can make if you have a landowner who's interested in potentially doing some sort of a, a timber harvest or, or they're interested in doing, um, you know, creating canopy gaps, um, not necessarily a timber harvest, but just enhancing habitat through uh, sort of management practices. If they leave those treetops uh, in place um, and don't cut them up too much, sort of leave those, those sort of big piles of treetops uh, that will, or, or tree you know, branches, that will you know, uh, help increase the amount of fine and coarse woody material. Um, and it'll also sort of help with regeneration. If you notice limited cavities, limited snags, uh, you know, suggesting the landowner is sort of retain biological legacy, legacies, including large diameter trees. Um, and also snags, so make, allowing those features to continue to persist in their woodlands. Okay, um, so that is the, the end of that section. Um, Kelly, do you, are, or, or Hugh, are there questions? Looks like there have been a lot of questions or we comments from the chat. <laughs> a, lot of them, a lot of them are about invasives, you know, the, uh, a lot of people want to know the same things that we want to know about invasives and how do we get rid of them and what kind of chemicals and what do I do if we've got an understory that is dominantly invasive? So um, some people, let me see here, I'll, I'll pull up one. Um, okay, my understory and midstory is predominantly invasive. Should I keep removing and hoping that the native species will repopulate or just let it go? Now I know um, on our last webinar, we stayed on a little bit while longer than the 8, 8.30. And we discussed this quite a bit. And, you know, uh, like Corey had said earlier, if you see an area on your property that's just massive and it, it can be pretty discouraging or um, just unable to do to clear it all out. But if you can keep it not letting it come on your property any further. It push it back a little bit, but there is benefits to having an understory, even though it's all invasive, there are benefits to it. Um, you know, push it back a little bit, but I think we would all get really discouraged really quickly if we tried to completely clear out all of the invasives and just hope that natives will take place, uh, take root in there. And also the invasives, they, they green up much quicker in the early, early in the spring. So when they green up quickly, it blocks out the sunlight and areas that the natives can come in. Um, Corey, I don't know if you want to add more to that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, invasives can be a real challenge. Um, you know, and definitely there are properties out there that are just covered with invasives, but, you know, if you sort of take the time to, to sort of assess the property and understand, are there areas where, you know, maybe there isn't as many invasives, um, you know, you, it's a good time, you know, to kind of targeting those areas and trying to free those, those areas of invasives um, and keep them that way is, is sort of one thing you can do. I think there, you know, I don't think that, um, you know, uh, when people, Thing people say these days is you can't really get rid of the invasives, but you can manage them. So, you know, keeping them out of areas that are, are fairly free of invasives or uh, limiting the introduction of new invasives. Um, and, you know, if you've got areas with heavy infestation, slowly picking away at them. Um, you know, maybe say, you know, I'm going to deal with a, 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 you know, a 10 by 10 foot area this year. Uh, and just try to clear that area, plate, plant a few native shrubs to sort of replace the invasives and just push back a little bit at a time. Um, you know, invasives are, are a serious challenge, but, um, you know, 
we definitely encourage you and encourage landowners to, to put some effort in trying to, to keep them under control. Okay, and there's another good question that just came in. Does a sparse understory mean too many deer or will it happen just because of a complete canopy? That's a good question. Uh, I think if it's very, very sparse, it's a combination of both. Um, you know, if you have a, you know, if, if uh, you have a pretty uh, dense canopy, uh, you know, certainly it's going to limit certain species uh, from being found in the understory, but there are others that, that can tolerate like spice bush or, or witch hazel. Uh, but if you, you don't even have them, then I'm going to guess that there's a lot of deer in that area as well. Yeah, here in our section um, of Connecticut, we have an area that has a lot of deer. And in fact, even in people's yards, they do not have um, any understory. Everything from about five feet and below, even their planted evergreen shrubs around their houses, there is absolutely no understory. Um, so that, that right there is from, we have so many deer in the area. Yep. And another question is, can anything be done about too many deer? Yeah. And I, I think that's another question like the invasives. We could have an entire another webinar just on that question. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, I, I've, you know, so some landers, landowners obviously, you know, will, will allow hunting on their property, whether they hunt themselves or whether they, um, you know, allow a neighbor or a friend to hunt on their property. And that, that can help keep the, the number of deer down. Um, you know, other people love the deer and, and certainly don't want to do that. And in, in that case, it, it is doing things like leaving um, fine and coarse woody material on the forest floor, piling it up. Um, you know, so if you see some, some oak saplings coming up, pile it up around them so that those, those oaks have a chance to regenerate. Um, you know, you can, you know, the, the, the non-living components of, of the, the sort of vertical diversity, they, can't, they don't necessarily replace the living components, but it's some structure that you can, can have in your, your understory if there's a lot of deer. And that, that structure from the non-living things might uh, allow for some of the, some understory to sort of develop um, in and between the, the sort of uh, woody debris that's on the ground. And Aaron is asking, so deer don't really like birch? You know, I don't know 100% what are the preferences of deer. I know they certainly love oak. They don't seem to like beech. I don't think they like black birch very much. So those are species um, that seem to do fine okay in the understory. And that's sort of what uh, a lot of foresters are sort of anticipating is that, you know, we, we have you know, this wonderful oak canopy right now, but our future canopy uh, might be a lot more beech and birch uh, than our current canopy just because those species the deer don't seem to like as much. Okay. Okay, I think we went through quite a bit of those. Awesome. Uh, do you want to just kind of recap on, we can, uh, I'll pull up the poll again and we'll see if people, okay. uh, how people feel about the, uh, the question. Yes. Okay, guys. Put on your thinking caps. You see this? See this picture here? What do you think the understory is? Open? Moderately dense or very dense? Just a couple more seconds. Everybody got their answers in. Look at that. Yep, I would say Moderately that this is dense. great job. <laughs> yep, I would say this one is moderately dense. I mean, there is certainly some vegetation in the understory, um, you know, but you you still can see a decent ways into the woods. So I think moderately dense is a is a good description for this understory. Excellent, ninety two percent. That's a good score. Okay, and homework number three. What habitat features that are good for birds do you recognize on your park property or favorite park? <clears throat> you guys have been doing a, a great job 
do an identification of bird species and plants and trees and shrubs. So of all these features that you're learning about tonight, and I'm, I'm sure you're probably all already thinking of the features that you have on your own property. So we want you to take pictures of those and, and the ones that are really good for birds and send them in. And um, I will put it together for our next webinar and show you guys uh, how great you're doing on your homework assignments. And uh, I think this, this particular uh, homework assignment is, is especially good because you know, you're gonna be looking for these habitat features um, you know, that you're similarly gonna be looking for when you go and do habitat assessments. So we want you to go out, give it a try, see what you can recognize, see what you notice, and then report back to us. Okay, um, so moving on, um, the last topic I wanna cover tonight is landscape context. Where a property is located, what the land cover and habitat, and what land cover and habitat types are found adjacent to the property can impact the recommendations that you make to a landowner. Now, uh, we're gonna start out by looking really broadly, and then we'll sort of narrow it down to, to directly around a property. Uh, so first of all, um, where a property is located in Connecticut um, might impact the sort of recommendations you have for a landowner. Uh, this map here is uh, Audubon's forest focal areas and potential forest focal areas. And uh, you'll notice um, that these areas are areas where the percent forest, um, if you look at um, a one kilometer by one kilometer sort of cells across the entire state of Connecticut, um, there are certain areas of the state where you tend to have uh, more, more forest cover. And the lime forest block being one of those areas. So here's the lime forest block right here. Um, it was initially lime north and lime south. We eventually pushed it together and made it one big block. But, um, but you know, anywhere where you see this sort of dark green color, those are areas where um, you have 80, an area that's 80% forested. So um, that's why these areas were sort of designated as our, our forest focal areas. Um, so, you know, kind of when you're doing an assessment for a property, you guys are all doing them in the, the lime forest block. But, you know, one thing that Audubon does is when we're considering, you know, what areas in the state are important for woodland nesting birds, we look at percent forest cover to that tell us, you know, which areas to be concentrating our efforts on. Zooming in to the lime forest block. Everybody knows this is an important bird area. Um, so I wanted to just provide a little bit more detail on it. So the forest block is roughly 60,000 acres of mostly undeveloped contiguous woodlands across six towns. Um, you can see it outlined in, in orange dots in this map. Um, and then the green areas are, are state forests or state parks uh, that are within the lime forest block. And uh, across the, the block, there's a variety of habitats from mature forest to shrub scrub and early successional habitats, to wetlands, to vernal pools, um, and the Eight Mile River and its watershed. And one recommendation that I think I suggest that everybody checks when they're doing their habitat assessments is to keep interior forest intact, avoid subdividing, minimize construction of new roads or trails um, that are greater than 20 feet or wider, and keep new buildings close to existing roads. Um, so when uh, landowners are maybe thinking about their property, say somebody wants to build a garage, Build it as close as possible to the current house. Um, you know, try to keep trails uh, narrower so that um, they are not sort of fragmenting that wooded habitat. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the lime forest block is important to a wide variety of forest nesting birds, but one in particular is the cerulean warbler. And uh, this isn't a bird that's included in our birders dozen just because it's not a very common bird across Connecticut, but the lime forest block is probably the place where it is most likely to be found in the entire state of Connecticut. Um, so I would almost add this as a 13, uh, 13th bird to the birders dozen species list. Um, Cerulean warbler is a species that uh, is on the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List, and they list it as vulnerable because the population is declining across a wide uh, uh, area of its range. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's sort of found within certain locations within the lime forest block. Uh, for its habitat, it needs mature deciduous forests to breed. 
Um, often it needs very big trees. So uh, it will nest on the horizontal branch of a really big like oak tree. Um, that's, uh, and it likes to have a dense canopy, not too much vegetation in the midstory, but then it actually likes a nice dense understory underneath the dense canopy. Um, and it also associates with canopy gaps, whether they're uh, gaps from a fallen tree, uh, uh, gaps that were sort of created by through management, uh, gaps next to a river um, or along a power line corridor. Uh, so that's where you tend to find cerulean warblers. I've also been told they told they like to associate, uh, they can be associated with hillsides as well. Um, and this species is definitely threatened by deforestation and ha habitat fragmentation. Uh, so, you know, I, this, you know, since the habitat assessments you're going to be doing are in the lime forest block, and this is a species that's a particular concern that's found in the lime forest block, um, you know, do you do want to be also keeping an eye out for this one when you're doing your habitat assessments? Um, maybe uh, uh, if uh, Hugh or Kelly, if one of you can quickly go online and pull up a song for a cerulean warbler, I think it would be great for people to hear. Um, just because the audio on my computer doesn't work right if I try to play sound, so I can't play it from my computer. But if one of you guys could pull it up, that would be great. But this is just uh, one species to keep in mind when you're doing habitat assessments in the lime forest block. And uh, I mentioned a cerulean warbler. You know, again, like I said, it's a it's a species that's of concern. Um, it's a species we actually call a responsibility species because across its range, it's declining at 2.6 percent a year. So you think about that, the number of birds that make up the cerulean warbler population is declining by 2.6% a year. So over four years, that's declined of nearly 10%. So it is really dropping in, in numbers pretty drastically. But uh, in Connecticut, it's actually increasing by 3.9% a year. So uh, Connecticut actually provides some very valuable habitat for the cerulean warbler. And you know that's kind of why we, you know, we do want you guys to be sort of looking for it and listening for it and pointing it out to warp, uh, landowners because it, it is a, a bird that can be found in the lime forest block that we have a real responsibility for. So uh, zooming in, you know, we started at the look across Connecticut level. We zoomed into the lime forest block. Now we're zooming in to uh, the area directly surrounding a property. And, you know, when we're, you, you guys are actually going to get some maps. When you go to do your before you go to get your habitat assessment, Kelly and Hugh are going to be making a variety, a bunch of different maps, and you will get some maps that will help you answer the questions: uh, What is the surrounding land cover? And uh, you know, surrounding land cover is important because you know you want to look: Are there hardwoods? Are there softwoods? Wetlands, fields, early successional habitat. Um, you know, a property. You know, a, a property that you're assessing. You know, may not have those all of these features, but if those features are found on surrounding properties then um, you know, the, the diversity of birds and wildlife in the area uh, might, be, but might be more than what you can see just on the property. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, you want to ask the question, you know, are there other protected open spaces nearby? Um, and sometimes uh, a property might serve as a wildlife corridor uh, linking other protect, you know, protected areas. And if that's, that's true for a particular property, you want to point that out to the landowner. You want them to understand that they, their, their property provides this important connection between other, between protected areas uh, in the vicinity of their property. And also you wanna look at uh, what is the size of the forest block that the property is a part of. And uh, in the data sheet, we'll ask you, you know, is it part of a, a 2,500 acre block? Is it part of a 500 to 2,500 acre block? Or is it part of a less than 500 acre block? As you would imagine, um, the larger the block, the larger number of woodland nesting bird species or diversity um, a, a property can support. support. So, um, you know, if, if they happen to have, maybe their property is only 25 acres, but it's part of this, you know, 3,000 acre block of forest, you know, that's something to point out to them. You want them to know that, um, you know, they're, they're a, a, a small part of this really big forest block, and it's important that they, they do what they can to help maintain that forest block. So these are examples of the maps you guys are going to get. Um, this is uh, two maps from an uh, assessment that was done for Kent Land Trust. So other side of the state, but um, they give a good example of a sort of, they, but these are the type of maps you guys will get. And the map on the left is, you know, sort of the property. Um, the Kent Land Trust's property was about 250 acres, so much bigger than the properties you guys will be assessing. Um, but 
you know, can kind of look at this map and see uh, that there's an awful lot of forest in this area. You can see that there's also some, some hay fields. And there's a little bit of water. There's a pond here. And there's also some streams. There's Pond Mountain um, Brook. There's the Fuller Mountain Brook. And then this is the Housatonic River here. So um, you can see that while the property itself is mostly uh, hardwoods, um, the surrounding area does include some, some big open meadows, uh, includes, looks like there's a little bit of sort of uh, hard uh, softwood forest down here. There are these various streams or riparian corridors, and that's going to add to the diversity of, of habitats and of birds that are found in that area. Uh, from this map, which is the map that has um, uh, protected land on it, you can see that not only is the, the Kent Land Trust land property protected, but it's also adjacent to a section of the Appalachian Trail. It's very close to a property owned by Pound Mountain Trust, um, just across the river from Kent Falls State Park and just south of the Sharon Land Trust property. So this property provide, is a sort of a, a component of a much larger sort of stretch of, of forested land. Um, and you know, so it, it adds value to this area. This is a map that shows uh, interior forest. So if you click on this link here, um, or you guys will have access to this PowerPoint, so you'll be able, and Kelly can send this link tomorrow too. Uh, the state of Connecticut's um, Center for Land Use Education um, and Resources uh, did a forest fragmentation uh, analysis in 2015. And they basically were able to determine where are the areas that have forest blocks of more than 500 acres, between 250 and 500 acres, and then um, less, than 500, less than 250 acres. So this dark green area um, is uh, a forest block that's more than 500 acres. So, you know, the, the Kent Land Trust property is right about here. And you can sort of see that it is part of this, this much larger forested block. Um, and then there are additional forested blocks nearby that are a very large, good large size. And then there's one right here that's sort of a, the smaller size, but, you know, with all these other ones around, it's, it's a pretty important. Uh, one thing that I, I realized that we have that we are going to share with you guys is uh, this is a map of the lime forest block that uh, similarly shows, uh, you know, it basically took the information, the, the data that uh, the Center for Land Use Education and Research uh, provided and sort of created, created a map of, of, for the lime forest block. And uh, you can really see this help map really helps to illustrate, you know, just that there's a large, these, these big dark green areas are are areas um, of the forest blocks that are more than 500 acres in size. So, you know, if you're doing a property, a, a, a habitat assessment for say a property, um, you know, in Lyme, you know, it, it, you can sort of see from this map that it's, it's part of a, a large forest block. Um, so this is a map that we can share with you guys. So when you're sort of assigned the property that you're going to assess, you can look at this map and it will help you understand the landscape context. I want to sort of just provide one more example of sort of looking at the landscape context. This is a property that's owned by the Avalonia Land Trust um, in Stonington, Connecticut. And uh, this was the property there. And if you just look at the surrounding landscape, you know, again, there are some, some fields uh, off to the, off to the, the east, uh, some other fields off to the, the west. The property has a good amount of, um, of softwoods you can really sort of see these sort of darker areas which are softwood patches. Um, and then you can just make out there's a bit of a forested wetland in here. And then there's also this wetland that's off to the, off to the west of the property. Um, so you've got hardwoods, you've got softwoods, you've got wetlands, um, you've got uh, meadows and sort of fields nearby as well, additional um, wetlands or ponds. So, you know, the area provides a good variety of habitats. If you look at the sort of protected land map, um, you can really understand the value of this particular Avalonia Land Trust property because uh, there is very limited other protected habitat in the area. So, um, you know, the fact that they have this property and are sort of maintaining it, um, you know, as open space is, is a really good thing. And then if you look at uh, the uh, interior forest map that CLEAR provides, uh, again, their property is sort of right about here it is part of a, a large forest block of, of more than 500 acres. So that's an important thing to know and something I'm sure that we, we mentioned to the land trust when we walked the property with them. 
Okay, so that sort of wraps up the landscape context. Um, and uh, I think we are just at eight o'clock, so perfect timing. Um, but we are all glad to stay on and take some questions.